This is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. Words taken from the lesson this morning and from the gospel, we heard this. Then he said to Thomas, put thy finger hither, and see my hands, and bring hither thy hand, and put it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At the beginning of the penitential season of Septuagesima, we began reflecting on beauty. And we had some help from St. Thomas Aquinas. Beauty. St. Thomas says, beauty includes three conditions, if you remember. First, integrity or perfection. Since those things which are impaired are by that very fact ugly. So perfection, meaning all the pieces are in place, number one. Number two, due proportion or harmony. Due proportion or harmony. And third of all, brightness or clarity. Whence things are called beautiful, which have a bright color. Thank you, St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, if you recall, we applied this definition to virtue, which is always beautiful, because all the parts of nature and grace are in place. The intellect, the will, and the passions, the head, the heart, and the body, they all come together to work in harmony under the guidance of God's grace, God's power. Virtuous actions are done in proportion to the situations faced in this veil of tears. They're neither in excess or in defect, and that's what makes them so beautiful, and that's why they're virtuous. So the virtuous soul of the faith-filled servant of God even begins to glow, to shine upon this fallen world. As a result of this integrity, this harmony, this proportionality, and splendor of the soul in working so well with God, virtue is truly beautiful to behold. We all know this to be true. Do we not enjoy watching even those who have some natural or physical virtue, playing some sport or carrying out some difficult task with what seems to be childish ease? If you've ever been to Arlington Cemetery and you watch the soldiers in their formation burying a soldier, it's amazing the harmony and how perfectly they do everything. And it looks so easy the way they do it. But it's pure virtue. Do not parents relish seeing virtue on display in their children? That's my child. That's my boy. We love it. So too is God very pleased with us when we practice and act with supernatural virtue. We become beautiful in his eyes. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But whence comes this ability to be beautiful? It is from the king of kings. He became beautiful and most pleasing to God first. We would never be able to do it unless he had done it first. Thus making it possible for us afterward. As strange as this may sound, he accomplished this. He achieved this supreme beauty before God most perfectly by way of his passion. In other words, only with the presence of his holy wounds which, as we heard in the gospel, he kept on his glorified body. And if you just think about it, these five wounds on the body of our Savior are the only man-made things in heaven. Heaven is not made by man. It's not made by human hands. And yet there's something up there that's made by man, and they're on the body of Christ. Wow. But he, with the presence of these holy wounds, which he kept on his glorified body, did all the parts come together to make him perfectly beautiful for all time. It's almost as it were he needed these wounds 
to be perfectly, supremely beautiful. In other words, sacrifice, wounds were needed to achieve this. Only with these wounds were all the parts in place. This is the mystery of being Catholic, of being Christian, of understanding God. This is indicated in the lesson of St. John today. He says, this is he that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. As the scriptures indicate, water is ever present from the very beginning of creation. If you read recounting of creation throughout the Old Testament, they're always mentioning water. Amazingly, modern science has found water in some form or other in nearly every place of the cosmos it looks. Including the sun, the sun has water in it. In the form of steam, obviously. And places in outer space, there's water sitting there, literally in outer space. Proof of fact. Scientific articles written all about it. But creation was incomplete, we can say, incomplete without a Savior who would die for, die for the children of God, pouring out his own blood. So in other words, the seventh day of rest did not arrive without the shedding of blood. Remember, the animals had to be shed their blood in order for Adam and Eve to be clothed. Thus, he kept his wombs as integral to his being savior, to being king of all time and all things. Thus, St. John adds, there are three that give testimony on earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three are one. They are harmonious. They are proportional. They are integral. They are beautiful. Now, St. Alphonsus seems to hit upon this in his Stations of the Cross, which you heard many times, I think, during this Lent. Sixth station. My most beloved Jesus, thy face was beautiful before, but in this journey it has lost all its beauty because it's been beaten. It no longer has all the proportionality. And it has wounds and cuts. And wounds and blood have disfigured it. Alas, my soul was also once beautiful when it received thy grace in baptism, but I have disfigured it since by my sins. Thou alone, my Redeemer, can restore it to its former beauty. Do this by thy passion. Thank you, St. Alphonsus. So by his wounds we are healed. Somehow, through this blood, we're going to be restored. And so the restored and augmented beauty of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, it's shown on Easter morning and is available for all who desire it, who want to rest in the Lord. All the parts are in place. They are proportional. They are complete. And they are glowing bright as the sun. His wounds will slay the Antichrist in the end and undo all the ugliness of error, disbelief, and sin he and his father and master, the devil, bring upon the world. These wounds make Christ our Lord, as strange as this may sound, these wounds make him perfectly beautiful, and they will make us beautiful too. St. Augustine made this observation. He says, perhaps in that kingdom of heaven, we shall see on the bodies of the martyrs the traces of the wounds which they bore for Christ's name. Because it will not be a deformity, but a dignity in them. And a certain kind of beauty will shine in them, in the body, though not of the body. Hmm... Well, let us now then, understanding this at least to some degree, it's a mystery, it's meant to be. Let us now then turn to one of the most important ways he makes this perfect beauty available to us, namely the sacraments. So in today's gospel, he instituted the sacrament of confession. He breathed on them and he said to them, 
receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. And whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. St. Augustine writes about this passage, Our merciful God wills us to confess in this world that we may not be confounded in the other. Let no one say to himself, I do penance to God in private. I do it before God. I don't need the sacrament of confession. Is it then in vain that Christ has said, whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven? Is it in vain that the keys have been given to the church? Do we make void the gospel, void the words of Christ? No. Thank you, St. Augustine. We use the sacrament because it is beautiful. So in any case, we say that this sacrament is beautiful in itself because all these parts, when they flow together, it's a beautiful experience. Have you ever seen confession or experienced it? You'll know what I mean. And it produces beauty in the soul of man. All the parts fall back into place. They get back into order. In the beginning, Adam and Eve, they were created in a state of grace. That means originally, at the start, man was body and soul with the Spirit of God dwelling in him. It is said by some of the fathers of the church that Adam and Eve literally glowed with light from the indwelling of God. That was their clothing. They saw each other's nakedness but through the light of God. It did not affect them in any adverse way. In a word, Adam and Eve were created beautiful in the garden. Everything was proportional. Everything was in place. And they were glowing with light and life. But alas, with sin, grace was lost. And they started down the road of ugliness Things got out of place. The head, the heart, and the passions got out of order. And concupiscence raised its ugly head. The main point here is this. In God's plan, man is incomplete. He's ugly without grace. Anybody who's had experience with people not living in a state of grace know this is true. And this is why sinful man is restless until he rests in the Lord. This is why sinful fallen man roams the earth, as it were, like the devils, ever seeking something to fill up what is lacking in his soul. He wants to be beautiful, but he's missing the main element. He tries to fill it with something that's not that thing. Namely, what we're looking for is grace, God. And so this is also why we can argue very easily science is deformed, prideful, arrogant, ugly, without theology. This is why society at large, society as a whole, the culture, is flat, plain, drab, lifeless, ugly, without the church to lift it up and give it life. In other words, folks, in one word, In Adam, we lost beauty. And the sacrament of confession enables the perfect beauty won by our Lord to be applied to souls and to be returned to us. Removing what's ugly caused by sins committed after baptism and supplying what true beauty requires, namely God's indwelling, His habitual grace in our souls, which begins to reorder the soul and virtue becomes possible. We touch his wounds in the sacrament and we are healed. So if you recall from catechism, there are three essential elements or acts of the penitent required to make confession a beautiful experience. So once again, beauty requires integrity. All the parts have to be in place. So in order for the sacrament to be beautiful, all the parts need to be in place. What's the first one? Confession or telling of sins. This is why we call it confession, because that's the first thing you do. After you know all your sins, you go in and you confess them. It is vital that we confess all mortal sins in kind and number to the best of our ability. I did this so many times. So an integral confession, we call it, with all the sins being labeled. 
and known to some degree integral confession. Number and kind. Just of mortal sins. You don't have to do that for venial sins. We detest and hate each of the sins, especially mortal sins. We must hate and detest them as best we can. And pray for it if you don't have it. Help me hate this sin, Lord. St. Paul says, hate what is evil in Romans. If in doubt, anyway, if in doubt, confess, hide or disguise nothing. So the first one is confessing or telling of our sins. Number two, we have sorrow, contrition. And one thing wonderful about the sacrament is we don't need perfect contrition. Imperfect works. And perfect sorrow is needed in the confession, the sacrament. Meaning that we're sorry because of what the sins do to us. Or what they may do to us if we die. We're sorry for the damage they cause us. In other words, namely pain, suffering, and ultimately hell. But if we do not have a chance to confess our sins to a priest in confession, we must try to make a perfect act of contrition, which is not easy to do. We like our sins, unfortunately, at times. And it's hard to be truly sorry for them. To the point where a perfect act of contrition can be made. So what is a perfect act? Well, that requires that we're sorry for the sins, not because they bring suffering and hell to me. I don't matter. What I'm sorry about is that they have hurt and crucified my Lord and Savior. That's a perfect act of contrition. It's impossible for man to make this without many graces being granted by God. It can take years for even devout souls to attain that level of sorrow. Thus, God has to assist the soul with many graces at the point of death to help them make such an act. And to wait for such a moment when confession is readily available is presuming on God's mercy. Do we want to risk it? Also, we must strive to be sorry for each and every sin confessed to the best of our ability, especially mortal sins. I've already said this. So to increase our sorrow, we should beg Our Lady of Sorrows. We should ask St. Mary Magdalene and other penitents to help us to have contrition as they did. And confession will be a beautiful experience. So keep in mind this basic fact of confession. This is so important. This is one of the most important things about this sacrament that we can learn. The amount of grace in the sacrament is given according to sorrow. The more sorry, the more grace. The more sorry, the more ordered your soul will become. The more sorry, the more your debt will be wiped away. The more beautiful our souls will become. St. John Vianney says, we should spend more time growing in sorrow for our sins than examining our consciences to get that down the number of sins perfectly. Because this is what's really going to make us more beautiful. Third of all, satisfaction for sin. So there's confessing your sins, there's being sorry for them. Now the third piece to make it fall into place is satisfaction for sins. We have to be willing to do penance and amend our lives to avoid the occasions of sin. And this is why the sacrament is sometimes called the sacrament of penance. The small penance the priest gives in confession is just a token of what needs to be embraced by the penitent if he wants that perfect beauty offered by Christ. So keep in mind that this is a sacrament. It has an outward and visible sign. Thus, all of these must be sensible. We can't whisper them so low that the priest can't hear it. We can't disguise it such that it's no longer sensible. We have to be plain in our speech and open and so he can hear me, not yelling, but at a very light whisper so the priest can hear everything. And if we're on a respirator in the hospital dying, squishing the hand will work. It's got to be sensible. Some sign. The sorrow should be expressed in a sensible manner as well, such as, Father, I'm sorry for these sins and all my past sins, and I ask pardon, penance, and absolution from you. And then a good act of contrition is stated, which usually encompasses all these things. 
And that is why each and every penitent should make an act of contrition to the priest. Notice that the proper matter for confession is not guilt. Rather, it is sorrow for sins. That's the proper matter for confession. And that is why we can always confess a past sin. You can always confess a past sin for which we're truly sorry in order to increase our openness to grace. Again, the more sorry you are, the more grace that is going to dump upon you, the more beautiful you'll become. When these are completed, something wonderful happens. The sins are wiped away. The soul receives grace. And we are made more beautiful. And peace of soul is found. Saints could see this fact. They would watch a soul go into confession, tarry and dark from sin. And they come out glowing with light. And they go, wow, miracle. The Kyrie of ours once said, all those who receive the sacraments are not saints, but the saints are always taken from among those who receive them frequently. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.